Hi everybody, welcome to Archie Marathon. Kevin Huey, Andrew Maynard, presenting and being in a crit, whether it's in an architecture studio or whether it's in a practice talking to clients, they're terrifying, always. But we've got lots of different mindsets that you should consider. Roll intro. Backwards. I think we're ready. <sighs> Have you got your mic on? Yeah. <laughs> Is that where it goes? <sighs> no? Does it sound okay? I mean, I'm going to get some sanitizer. Testing. Oh, oh, Testing. Jesus. It hurts. It hurts. Step one, disassociate yourself. Which means it is not about your project. It's never your building. Lots of people present the stuff and say, my building, my library. It's not yours. Yeah. And this is same, it's definitely something in practice. We always talk about the client's building, your building. You obviously can't do that if you're a student. So you talk about the building or you talk about your... Proposal. Yeah, your proposal or you talk about your user group that you're building it for, designing it for. Why is, why is that important? What you need to do all the way along is to try and remove your ego from the process. We'll come back to that. But also, so much of what we'll talk about today is actually making the person you're talking to, whether it's a tutor or whether it's a client, feel confident about the process. So you're arming them with the decision making. So instead of it being my building and I'm going to design it a certain way and you'll live in it, you're actually saying to them, this is your building, we care about you and the outcomes that will happen here. And also the fact that you disassociate yourself with the design, you are prepared to realize that this is just a proposal on a piece of paper at that moment in time. We, we talked about it in previous episodes about uh, making lots of drawings and, in, and without emotion. You know, the, the idea that you are not putting yourself on the line. They are just many iterations and you are just putting this iteration out for discussion. And that's quite important mindset to think about that yeah. it is not an attack on you it's not an attack it is actually a discussion about this particular design mm. one and, of many and you're a professional offering your advice if the client chooses not to accept that advice that's kind of their fault that doesn't mean you don't care i care deeply about every proposal but you need to remove yourself your your ego and your emotion from it because you'd learn that most ideas won't get up. So you've got to offer a lot and then see which ones stick. The same should be applied at university if you're presenting. This is, I've gone through this rigorous process and this is my recommendation for the site. What do you think? And you treat it then, you try to make it a collaborative process. This is not me defending my work. This is me putting forward a proposal. What do we all think? If you do that, it's good for your own mindset but it also arms the panel you're talking to with them being helping solve problems rather than attacking. You're not there to prove yourself. You're there to offer up a conversation to learn from or to discuss, right? So therefore, again, it's not about you. It is not about how much you know. In fact, often at universities, there's this uh, beautiful chart that shows the, the more, the less you know, in some ways you pretend that you know a lot of stuff. That's when you actually get shut down. But yeah. when you realize how much you don't know and you, you have a mindset of realizing that, okay, I don't know, but I need to, I want to learn. I'm just offering a conversation and you help me. You, you give them a guideline of thinking, how do you actually, how, did, how can they help you? Yeah. That humbling starting point is, is very important. Yeah. You think, I, I often think about science and science communication, I've brought this up before, um, and how scientists will say, in the end, we just don't know. But they'll actually talk about, if we take this and we take these things as being true, then that leads us to believe that maybe this is the case. So it's not a scientist saying, here's my proposal, I'm gonna put my name on it, this is true and correct. Like the, it's the, 
We don't live in an age of authority anymore. We now live in an age of expertise. So if you think about that, if you're the authority in something, you're the authority, it's about you. Where if you're an expert in something, you're saying, this is my expert advice. Again, disassociating yourself from your ego and making it about the subject. When, when I first became a parent, I did a lot of reading, how to be a good parent. And it was really interesting that um, they, they said, if you tell a child that they, they did that really well, they'll tend to try to do the same tasks over and over to make sure that they do it well again. Where to, if you tell, to get the praise. To get the praise. Where if you tell a child that was a great effort, so regardless of the outcome, not, you don't judge the outcome, you judge the process they went through. If you tell a child that that, that was a good effort, those children tend to try more and more things mm. and push themselves further and further. So you're debilitating the child in a way if you're just saying, well done, because then they're always looking for praise. So they tend to repeat things. Because it is human, after all. It is human to, you want praise. You want mm -hmm. to feel good. Yep. You know, that's, and then we'll get into the whole idea of hormones in the body. And... and also the social aspect. We are social creatures. That's right. So we seek approval. So another point is to be prepared to be wrong, to prepare to have a go. Yeah, that's from a great TED talk, probably known as the best TED talk by Ken Robinson. Link. Up there. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it talks about that, you know, children will have a go. Like, but the thing is, the education system, especially school, really stigmatise mistakes. Yeah. So people are less and less likely to make mistakes or want to make mistakes, let, let alone even do drawing that is not right. Yeah. And that, that is a huge problem. Arguably, the people that have made the most mistakes are either dead or they've learned the most. Yes. And in architecture school, the person that draws the most is going to have the most shots fired at them. But I tell you what, they're probably going to learn the most. You look at all the sports stars, they say, you know, that some of the best sports stars, basketball, football, whatever, they always say, yeah, I, I've got so many goals, whatever, but look at how many things I missed. Yeah, absolutely. And being professional in anything, this is the 10,000 hour rule that to be properly professional at something, sports or otherwise, you need to commit 10,000 hours to it. So in terms of architecture, that's 10,000 hours of drawing and design. It's not 10,000 hours of getting it right, of scoring every hoop, it's of going through the process so you refine it better. So bravery is important. Hmm. And again, going back to science, science is all about getting stuff wrong. You, there are so many scientific breakthroughs that have happened because a scientist has a hypothesis that they explore and they find data on and it gets proved to be completely false. But through that process, they actually learn other truths along the way that have led to Nobel Prize winning outcomes. So this idea of uh, making mistakes or just having a go really helps in that conversation at the very start, the first point is that you are offering mm. things for discussion. And so it's no point just having one, maybe you have tried many and just to be able to show the process and the conversation. Yep. And so if you're a student and you have a, a, an interim crit and you put up something, instead of lying and saying, this is great and trying to sell it to the panel, you're going to probably get a much more helpful response if you say, all right, so here's the process I've gone through. Here, here are the things I've discovered along the way. And here is how it's looking at the moment. I'm not feeling great about it for these particular reasons. You're arming uh, the tutors and the lecturers with the ability to engage in the conversation. Owning up to the fact that, yeah, I'm not feeling great about it. That's, mm -hmm. that's human, that's normal. Yeah, we're instead standing in front of the thing and saying, it's great, don't you agree? And then when they attack you being defensive, nobody's going to benefit out of that scenario. But that scenario, admit it, is the one that you see most with students. And one where in professional practice, you lose the client because they don't feel like they're being listened to. You gotta see it from the client or the juror's perspective. What does that mean? Well, they have been put into a position, often they've been busy at work or whatever, they, they turn up, and they've been put on pressure to make a comment. So whatever it is, they have to make a comment. So we've both been in this situation, and especially as young practitioners, so have a think about this. You're up and you're presenting in front of 
these people you respect, or maybe not, and all of your peers, and it's like everybody staring at me, this is stressful. Also, it very much is stressful for the panelists, especially younger practitioners, because they've got the same thing. They've got an audience, they're sitting beside people they are more senior than them, so the pressure's on them to make comments, and quite often they've got nothing to say. So they will actually say some stuff that comes across as sounding important because they want to have some sort of gravitas. And you're here, they're listening to it going, I don't understand, how is this helpful? Guess what, it's probably not helpful at all. Because like yourself presenting, you're in a stressful situation, they're in the same situation. And a lot of the time they'll be going through the motions. So you've got to be really careful in the hooks that you grab. Let somebody have a rant and if you don't think it's useful, let it go. And again, we've talked about this in past episodes, hopefully you've got a friend uh, in the audience that's taking notes for you. Or friends. Yeah. Multiple. Who are distilling that information to find out what's important. But again, be in the mindset of the people you're talking to. And this is where, especially in residential architecture, we've done so well, because a lot of commercial architecture is about time and money. Residential architecture is about emotion. Emotions, yes. So you need to be able to empathise with the person sitting on the other side of the table. So instead of me thinking, oh, they don't like it, that hurts my emotions, that hurts my ego, instead going, why are they acting negatively to this? What is going on in their heads? Oh, okay, I understand, I've failed to communicate it clearly, I've failed to hear from the last meeting and I've skipped a beat, so they're acting emotionally. The same thing will happen with people, with tutors or visiting professionals that act there looking all self-assured, but inside they might actually be searching for something. Something to say, yeah, it happens yeah. all the time. Yeah. It's actually, this is why it's good to sit in a crit and try to put yourself in that position. It's like, what if you are put under pressure to say something? What does that mean? What, yeah. what would you say? It, especially when a presentation is not clear, and they're not offering a, a discussion, they're just trying to sell a project, then you go, well, where, where, do, you, where do you start? That's such a good point, because if your only experience of this whole complex situation of a critique is you standing up and copping it, <laughs> presenting and then copying it, you're not then thinking about the communication process. You're not then empathising with the people involved. So stick around, just like we said in this episode, stick around and watch from the background everybody else's discussion. Put yourself in a position and think, what's it like? Because at the end of the day, this is what today's episode's all about, we are animals, social animals, that react emotionally, and fear drives decision making. So we have to rationalise ourselves through that. So another point is comfort zone. Comfort zone. Comfort zone. Comfort zone. It's a beautiful place, we all love it. Nothing grows there. So especially when you are meant to be about learning, that's not gonna happen. I think you should be challenged. I think you should not be in your comfort zone. So David Bowie said, when you go out in the ocean, uh, you want to be just to the point that you're barely touching the sand, barely tiptoeing, just almost floating. Almost drowning. Almost drowning to be able to do good work. That's, mm. where, that's where you should be at. You should be at your maximum capability and probably a little bit off that as well to, um, to do something. Because otherwise, yeah, comfort zone, you're not gonna, you're not gonna grow. So, if you're in your comfort zone, similar to our previous point, you're probably repeating the same thing. You got good feedback back for it once, so I'll just do it again. But if you're going through that bit of teaching of um, it's about effort, if you're trying new things, you're gonna be outside your comfort zone. But guess what? It's actually gonna be more rewarding. It's gonna be more fulfilling. And you're gonna learn more. Because the process is not about getting it right, because there is no right when it comes to design. It's about growing from each project into the next. And that's not just students. That's, that's just, not students. That's just every creative single, field. Every single project is flawed. A secret, I hate every single project at multiple times through the process, because I just see the problems in it. And there's something good about that because it means that I'm not sort of surrendering and saying this will do. So if our work's any good, it's because of this, like, you know, I've got to try again, I've got to try again, and keep working away at it, being sort of somewhat dissatisfied with it. We're, and that's where you learn. That's where I learn, that's where hopefully the work gets better each time, because I don't want a project to be perfect. I want it to be as good as it can be, knowing that 
it's pushed me a little bit further to the next project and that'll be more rigorous. Exactly the same process as you are being put through at architecture school, but nobody's telling you why you're being put through it. <laughs> why are you torturing me? <laughs> why are you torturing me? So I think we're gonna talk about the brain. To break it down in very simple ways, there is, um, if we look at evolutional psychology, there's this idea that we evolved from reptiles um, and the, the brain has got sort of three main growth compartments. So the first part is the most primitive part, which is the reptilian brain from the reptiles. And that responds in a way that is just fight or flight or, um, what's, or freeze, that's the third one. Yeah. But yeah, that is a pure uh, evolutional tool for survival. So you, all these hormones pumps in your body when you are under threat. So you fight or flight, but it, it, it is, most importantly, it is a survival instinct. And it is, Life the, or first, death. It is the first thing to trigger in any situation. Am I needed right now? It happens before the conscious brain yes. gets any time. Because again, if you're about to be eaten by something or if you're about to be hit by a car, it's not very useful to go, hmm, what does Kant think about this? What does Jacques Derrida think about this? You want your amygdala to fire and go. If you're in a stressful situation, guess which part of the brain is firing? If you're standing up in front of a crit panel, guess which part of the brain is firing? The fight or flight response. And then you've got all these hormones running through your body and yep. it doesn't feel great. You, you've all. all been there. You've sat there and you've presented to, to somebody and you can feel it. You can just like, and the freeze, and I just don't want to be here. Guess what? If you wait 30 seconds, that shit will calm down. Well, for me, the, the big one is to realize that is just an evolutional um, leftover. Yes, yep. Um, that, and these hormonal responses in your body is just that. And to realize and just tell myself, no one's gonna die, I'm not gonna die from this. Because that's what that signal was for. It's literally going, you're gonna die. Yep. You're gonna die. So you react in the most strongest way. Yeah, and so, emotional way. Yeah. So it all makes sense. And it, it is going to happen. That you are going to respond that way. And we're not saying don't respond that way, only be rational. Be aware that it's going to happen. And then allow yourself to accept that and move forward. Then there's the next layer, which is the mammalian brain, as in mammals, as, as a herd animal. You know, we rely on others in the family and the group to survive. So to be rejected by the group you often would die. Like again, you know, we're talking evolution. Um, yeah. and so, so you've got a support network of people and those people reject you and send you out into the wild, you, you're gonna die. Yeah. If you're standing in front of a panel of people, especially people who are your seniors. Or even friends. Head of the tribe and all of your friends are there and you get attacked, that need to be socially accepted kicks in. So then you will do and say whatever you can to be accepted. It's the embarrassment. Yeah. To be seen um, by your peers and, uh, or, you know, a certain way. So that's, yeah, that's, again, it's, it's hormonal response for survival. Yeah. So accept it, it's going to happen, then move on. Yeah. And, and again, just tell yourself, I'm not going to die from this. Yep. That to me, yeah, for my own journey, that, that was a huge one, just to realize that it happens but just understanding where that's coming from. Yeah. And that's really empowering. So to finish that, the brain thing, the outer most new part of our brain in evolution is the prefrontal cortex, which is the logical brain. That is the anal analytical brain. That's where language and all that stuff happens. But the other two, the limbic brain, is where emotion happens. It has no capacity for language. So that's why it's all gut feeling and how you feel in the heart. That's, that's where that is. And so again, to empathy, quite often, some people in your panel have got the same reaction because they're also on show, if you're a student. And also very much, it's the case that your client will be going through the same processes, especially if they don't feel listened to. So if you're acting emotionally defensive, suddenly the person on the other side of the table is also going to start to feel like they're not being listened to, that their comments aren't being accepted um, as though they, they're, they're valid or can be discussed. So they'll start acting emotionally. 
and it escalates from there to where you're in a situation where nobody's really finding a middle ground, but also nobody's really thinking. Like how many times have you done a presentation and come out and gone, I have no idea what happened? And that's because your, your amygdala is not writing information, it's reacting only. It overrides the prefrontal cortex and the, the logical brain to listen for words and understand the situation. If you watch people that do a lot of speaking in public, you'll notice that they'll spend the first couple of minutes with maybe a gag or shuffling things or doing something, looking up at the crowd, not launching straight in to their presentation. And what they're doing there is they are letting their animal brain react, they're staying calm, and they're getting themselves into a position where their logical brain can then start to take over. Okay, now I'm ready to go. So you see experienced um, speakers, it's still terrifying. Mm. You know, people say, oh, I don't like public speaking. You're on the same page. You've just got to be able to get up there and then work your way through that emotional state. And that works two ways as well. It's, it's disarming the crowd as well. Absolutely, mm -hmm. because the crowd is on your side. Like typically people want to see you go well. Again, we're social animals. Mm -hmm. People want to see you do well. And if they see you start to struggle, then they feel uncomfortable and you see it. And then you, as somebody that does a lot of public speaking, you start to feel uncomfortable. So it's putting everybody at ease. These are skills that once you understand how the brain works, are easily achievable. One more point about the, um, the primitive brain is, in general, if there's a lack of information, you, by default, we will assume the worst. And again, that, that kind of feeling happens. Why? Again, it's uh, survival. You know, if you are sleeping at middle of the night in a cave and you heard a sound outside, do you get up and check out whether it was a lion or not? Or would you just keep sleeping? For those who just kept sleeping and uh, they didn't make it. <laughs> you usually got eaten. Yeah, so, you know, I think it's just a human behavior to assume the worst for uh, survival. So. What does that have to do with anything? Well, yeah, we, we get information that is just not enough. You, like, you, you quit could be poker face. You, you cannot read them. It, they didn't say anything useful. Or, you know, even just the idea of, yeah, I'll see you tomorrow. You know, you get this email in the middle of the night. Like, yeah, if I grab one of my staff members and say, hey, can we go have a talk, please? Oh, yeah. Guess what their immediate reaction is. So I have to say, hey, can we go have a chat? And I have to say, it's nothing scary. We're just talking about work <laughs> and just yes. to immediately have them chill out a bit. Um, but with lack of information, again, think about when you're in a crit situation, sometimes you're getting a huge amount of noise, especially from some people that just feel like they have to take up space and they're delivering a lot of waffle at you and you're desperately trying to search for what is this actually about? I don't really understand this. A lot of it's esoteric. Um, there's a lack of information, but there's lots of stuff coming at you. Stay calm. One of the best things you can do um, in a situation where you're not sure um, is to engage with them. So instead of going, oh, I think you've attacked me, so I'll just say a whole heap of waffle back, and then they don't feel listened and it escalates, is to maybe try to parrot some of that back to them. So are you suggesting A, B, and C? Or if it really is esoteric, and you don't want to hear any more of it. A really great way of dealing with it is like, that's really interesting. Do you mind if I grab you for five minutes after the presentation? I don't know if I really get it now and we don't have time, so let's do that later. So yeah, that's a good, good idea. And so what you've done, again, we're all emotional creatures, is you've said to that person, I validate and respect your nonsense and waffle. <laughs> um, you've said that to them so they can de-escalate and also, you've managed to change the subject. You can move on instead of just becoming this strange thing that we've all seen in presentations. So what can you do apart from just mindset in here? What can you physically do? So one of the things you can do, uh... one of the things you could do is watch the next episode because this is getting way too long and we are going to talk about the t practical tricks that you can do during presentation to alleviate any stressful situations like comment subscribe and uh, check out discord
That's where a lot of this conversation came from originally. And support our work on Patreon. Thanks. See you soon. <laughs>